My name is Michael Gayad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me there is Michael Co. Mike, I've always seen you over the years. You and I have never actually met or spoken before, but edu- in- introduce yourself to the audience and to me more formally, obviously. Who are you? What's your background? What have you done throughout your career? And what are you doing, Carl? Yeah, sure. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. I think you're one of the more prolific contributors to the conversation about finance. So I've been I, I following you. Meant, I think great... you meant annoying. I think you meant annoying. Ah, well, <laughs> I've been following with a great deal of interest because there are there people who have a lot to say, and, and you're one of them. I began my career as a, as a floor trader, options market maker. We, we focused on uh, statistical volatility arbitrage. We operated on what were then the four principal options exchanges back in the, in the 90s. That was the Philex, the Amex, the Picos, and the, and the SIBO. I migrated, as floor traders would say, upstairs. A few years later, I worked on the buy side uh, at a, a deep dive fundamental long short multi-billion dollar hedge fund in Los Angeles called Ivory Capital. And then I was uh, recruited to, to start the institutional listed equity derivatives business for Cantor Fitzgerald. I'm trying to remember when that was. It was probably around 2006 or so. I ended up becoming a partner there. Uh, and then later joined CRT Capital, which was, uh, there's two CRTs for those who are listening and, and are, some will know CRT, which was a Chicago research and trading outfit. And then there was another one, which was Credit research and trading, which was the East Coast-based firm that got recapitalized by Aquiline after the GFC. And I was going to do the essentially the same thing there that I had done at Cantor. They ran into some headwinds on their primary dealer application after MF Global collapsed with uh, Corzine at the helm. And then I entered the, uh, the fintech space. So I teamed up with some folks um, who specialize in artificial intelligence. They had sold a previous AI company to Cisco Systems called Park Technologies. They they were a spin-out of Imperial College London. I've been working with those guys on basically AI-driven systematic investment strategies, some using options, some not, but all of them do some analysis of the options market to gauge sentiment, risk, opportunity, that sort of thing. And, and then we created a, an RIA to do that. Uh, we were managing some money in SMAs, started an ETF, and we're in talks right now actually to, to merge with a New York-based firm. Uh, we'll see if that actually ends up happening. But it'll be principally uh, a family office actually at that point if that, if that goes through. Uh, we'll probably keep the RIA on the side uh, and probably have to if we're going to do ETFs. But yeah, that's that's my story in, in a nutshell. So there's a couple of uh, things I want to pick your brain on here. This is something that I've been thinking about more recently. If we did not have AI mania, AI hype, do you think that it would be more clear where we are in the cycle? And the reason that I frame it that way is you've got the AI name is a magnificent seven, and then you've got 63% of the Russell 3000 negative year to date after inflation in a pre-election year, which is supposed to be the strongest of the presidential cycle. It seems to me that if we never had the AI story out there, people would be probably much more negative about the state of the world. Yeah, I I agree with that completely. Look, most people probably don't scrutinize their 401k statements that closely. Most people are probably not very active, self-directed investors. And so their benchmark for the performance of sort of risk assets is going to be the headline index figures that they see on CNBC, on Bloomberg, Fox Business, and uh, in general. Some people might look at Yahoo Finance and pull up SPY, for example. That sort of gives them a sense. And of course, that can be quite illusory, right, for the reasons you suggest, which is that, number one, cap-weighted indices are always going to be propelled by a handful of the largest stocks. And the moves in those, especially growthy types of names, that are associated with the latest frenzy, you know, can support an index all on their own. So, you know, it's funny, many years ago, there used to be this idea that, you know, a monkey throwing darts at a board could outperform an active manager. And I'm sure most of the people who are listening to this are are familiar uh, with that. But that's actually, to your point, not true. Unless your monkey happened to hit NVIDIA and a handful of other stocks, Chances are they're looking at most of the publicly traded equity markets in the United States. Um, they're not doing so hot. So that is, that's absolutely a reality that if you only look at those headline figures, it can be deceptive. And I think there's a lot of statistics that people look to that are deceptive. And it's deceptive not because the number itself is a lie, although we can 
argue about whether or not the numbers are, are really legitimate, but also because those figures can lead people to a place where they think either that there is a problem or that there isn't one. And what I'm talking about here as an example might be something like inflation. So if you have a target rate of inflation of 2%, and everybody thinks that that's a good number for whatever reason, because 50 years ago, people agreed that's a good number. When inflation rises to nine, falls back to three and a half, people are comforted by that, right? Instead, instead of looking at prices, prices relative to incomes, things like this, and, and that ends up getting us to where this story leads us, um, you really end up with a, with a problem because you're, you're looking at a number that seems like it's approaching a target, but even if it gets back to that target, that doesn't mean that the, that the problems were, that were created when it went to nine have been resolved, and indeed they haven't been. So I, I think that it's, there was a book that was written by, I think his name was Chris Cottle. It was about options as it happens many, many years ago. I think it was called Options, Perception, and Deception. I'm, I don't happen to have a copy of it on my office credenza, so I can't say for sure if that, that is the title. That's just what I remember. But I think that's true for a lot of statistics, and I think it's true for headline index numbers like the S&P. I also wonder if it's, a, it's, a, it's impossible to know, of course, uh, without the alternative history, but I wonder if the AI push is what made all the recession narratives from last year hitting this year ultimately wrong. Because to to your point, most people are invested in market cap Vanguard type products in their four hundred one ks in their personal accounts, and there's a wealth effect that comes from that. And to the extent that that AI narrative has made people feel wealthier, maybe just prolong the inevitable recession because of that idiosyncratic aspect of the Magnificent Seven, right? As meaning that all the narratives would have been right had it not been for that throwing things off. Yeah, it's, there is the, there's the perceived wealth effect, and then there's also just consumer you know, behavior. Sometimes it's a, it's a big ship. It's slow to, to stop or turn around. And as evidence of that, we can just look at uh, levels of, say, revolving uh, credit, right? Which just recently at all-time highs. That's evidence that consumers, even if they want to change their behavior, probably doesn't change that quickly. And consequently, ours being a largely consumer-driven economy is going to continue to show at least some strength as long as people continue to spend. And they may do that until they can't do that. And I think that's, that's where we're getting to, right? That's, that's always the case. When you get these kinds of situations at a corporate level, it's going to be a credit event, but at a consumer level, it's also going to be a liquidity and credit event. And I think we're probably approaching that now. Yeah, I, I name the space. The recession begins, and you and I have done the media rounds for a lot. We both know that the negative narrative does tend to get more eyeballs and eardrums. It's just the nature of the beast. And a skeptic would say, well, people have been talking about a recession, or in my case, a credit event for a long time. and it, just keeps get on getting pushed out? When are you going to change your view on things? I want to hear your kind of macro thoughts on where we are now or where we could be headed. I always go back to my default, which is that opportunity always exists when the crowd thinks it knows an unknowable future. So everybody thought recession last year would hit this year, didn't hit this year. Now it seems like the narrative is not even going to be a soft landing, it's a no landing, and the Fed was able to pull it off. It makes me contrary just from that viewpoint. But where are we on recession or no recession from your temple? I think we're I think we're going to see a recession. I think we're probably going to see it. My own forecast is probably in the in the four to seven month time frame. So we're talking late first, second quarter officially. Although my own expectation is that a lot of things like the title of your of your work lead and lag. I think we're going to start feeling the pinch maybe a little bit sooner, but we're going to start getting statistics, which are always backwards looking, right? So I think we're probably going to get the real numbers. We're looking March, somewhere between March and June. It's my guess. And this just comes down to a, a couple simple things, which is that, first of all, uh, obviously we touched on the consumer and a stretched consumer, higher rates, and you can see this in a lot of places, by the way. This is not, you can try to look to economic statistics, but if anybody and probably everybody on this call has a car, or purchases cars, trades them in, that kind of thing. Uh, as it happens, I have a kid who's about to get his driver's license. He's running around on a permit right now. So we're shopping around another car. And it is 
interesting to me to see just how, because we've been looking for a couple of months. I'm watching these prices plummet in real time, where before there was a sense of urgency, like, oh, we found something that's suitable. Now, I, I, I don't feel any urgency. Uh, the salespeople are calling, oh, the thing you looked at just came in. The demand is, is dropping fast. The higher rates are, are really biting people. People's savings are dropping. And as pointed out, their level of borrowing is, is elevated. And then you're going to have that same issue happening on the corporate side, right? A zero rate in, environment, it just keeps so many companies alive that would not be supportable in a real, sort of a real rate environment. And a lot of these companies are going to have to roll their debt over. And this worked just fine when, when rates just as they did for 30 years plus, just kept going from the upper left to the lower right. You could just roll your debt and take on more of it. And your interest expense didn't really rise because uh, the cost of capital was dropping fast enough that uh, you could actually just continue to borrow and borrow. We are not in that environment anymore. So if you have pressure on consumers and you have pressures on corporate borrowers, who then obviously have to slow investment or in a worse situation, you have companies that actually find themselves in significant distress. It's, uh, it's a lot of pressure that gets put on the economy. And at the exact same moment that all of that is going on, so we think money creation comes from a lot of quarters. And then, of course, it comes from central banks. And central banks, in an effort to fight inflation, also have to, at the very least, slow their money creation. And so if you say you can't fight money creation when it's expanding, I don't think that it's really reasonable to say that you can fight it when it's contracting. That doesn't make sense to me. You had used that term earlier, deceptive statistics. I wonder if you think that the S&P is deceptive as a discounting mechanism now because the auto bid from 401k inflows and if small caps are perhaps a better tell. Uh, just because they don't have that, that auto bid. That point about the, the zombie companies is one I've stressed for a while. So this is why I keep saying small caps hold the key in this kind of ominous way more recently. And that's because if it is going to be, if the Fed did stick the landing, then small caps just start to respond now because it would suggest that you're not going to have the, the real stream from how levered these companies are. Yeah. I think uh, number one, I think that's definitely true. I will say, I do want to, in fairness, say one thing, which is that, first of all, in, in one of our strategies, we're, we're long only, and we will tend to have some mega cap companies in there, some tech companies. And it's true that if you tried to gauge the health of equity markets by looking at their valuations, for example, you might say, well, that's definitely deceptive relative to, to small caps. Part of that is the auto bid. But part of it is uh, also that I think people like me and arguably you and other investors, if you, if you run a long only strategy, where are you going to put that money? I'm not particularly happy about equity valuations relative to fixed income now, which is the first time I can say that. I, mean, I remember talking to a lot of fund managers back in the 2011, 2012 time frame. I was... Uh, I was in LA, I think, for a couple of weeks, and there's a lot of there's a lot of fixed income managers in LA because Mike Milken had moved Drexel out there, and a lot of the guys that came out of Drexel started their own shops. There's a lot of smart credit investors there, and they were just they were tearing their hair out because they desperately wanted to be long equities because they were so undervalued relative to credit, and of course they were right. Now I think the opposite situation is true. But if you are going to be long equities, you have to be long some of the, the bigger companies for a couple of reasons. Number one, they've got the strongest balance sheets. They're generating huge cash flow. In many cases, their businesses are idiosyncratic. I'm not encouraging people to chase NVIDIA at all-time highs here. We do happen to own it. But and this is definitely a hold-your-nose kind of a situation. But the fact is that when you have businesses that are generating massive amounts of free cash flow that seem to have a little bit of a moat around their business are growing at a 
great rate, that still seems a hell of a lot better than buying something at eight times earnings that actually has negative free cash flow, has a lot of debt that's going to roll over, stag on the top line, which, you know, just for what it's worth, folks who are listening, when you see stagnant on the top line, that means the company's actually shrinking, right? Because if you take a look, if their revenues are the same today, give or take, as they were three years ago, that company's a lot smaller. Make no mistake. So it shouldn't be trading at a market multiple or a small, a couple turns cheaper. It's a shrinking business. And if they also have a lot of debt, and they're going to be rolling that over. They don't have a lot of free cash flow. It's a business that's severely constrained. So that's why you get these huge spreads in multiples. Part of it is the auto bid that you're talking about. People just, you know, a certain percentage of their paycheck every two weeks gets dumped into the S&P and it's going to be auto-weighted to the biggest names. But there's some rationale to being into in some of those stocks as well, I think. And actually, I'm curious what's going on with... I, I didn't happen to look, you know, with Satya Nadella taking Sam Altman on. What's going on there in Microsoft? Let's see. Well, yeah, so that hits an all-time high. So, you know, that idiosyncratic, a lot of cash flow, still growing type of story holds water simply because the alternatives aren't so great. So that's uh, another point I would make. I, I do often sound quite bearish, but then people probably don't realize that for most of the stuff we do, we're, we're long equities on balance. That's just, that's the nature of things. Yeah, don't get me started on that. It, 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 people simply can't understand you can be bullish and bearish at the same time, depending on time frame. Mm-hmm. And then just because you're bearish doesn't mean that you're expressing a path uh, a bearish path in your trading, right? In your opportunity set. It's, right. You can be bearish by being long equities by just being in utilities as opposed to tech, right? That's a bearish long only type of allocation. Okay, now now I'll push back a little bit and and uh, all those arguments are valid. When you look at historically these, these cycles where you have very concentrated momentum in a select number of stocks, that tends to be more what towards the end of a bull market and towards the beginning of a bear market. You saw that in the run-up to the tech wreck, 99, 2000. You saw that, I'd argue, in 2021, right? Small caps mm-hmm. peaked around February with GameStop mania and large caps kept on moving. Everyone said the large cap bear market started in November 2021. It actually started February for most stocks way before that. This year has some interesting parallels uh, to the 2021 dynamic. So while all that can be true, fundamentally and from a rationale perspective, I do wonder if what happened this year is just another kind of classic warning sign that we're not out of the woods in terms of what I believe is still a bear market that we're still in. So, yeah, I, I guess I should probably elaborate a little bit on the comments I was just making because part of the way I think about these things is, especially in long-only strategies, is that I tend to have a little bit of a, a barbell thing going on. An example would be we had Target and Walmart both reporting recently. And we were long both. Walmart, a name that I hold my nose because I just don't understand how a relatively mature business that, look, they're executing on digital and things like that, but still 29 times earnings. Now, there's a natural bid in companies like Walmart too, right? Because the family trusts tend to be net buyers. The company buys back its own stock. So situations like that. And then you have Target that's trading 13 times. Not exactly the same business, but in the same space. And the logic is that that one hasn't been executing, used to have better margins. They could just do one or two things right when they're probably doing three or four things wrong and start to get back to a mean multiple. Walmart, on the other hand, if you were running this as a pair, you'd probably short that one. But in a long-only strategy, there you're playing one side for its execution and the other side based on value. And actually that as a barbell or a pair. It worked out better as a pair, did okay as a barbell. I think that's something people need to to think about too. I own Kroger's, right? That's not that's not an exciting growth story. It's the exact opposite. But it's trading 10 times earnings and people are probably still going to eat and maybe they'll eat out less. So that could be good for Kroger, one could argue. Yeah, I think it's definitely true. So there's there's two views of this, right? One of the views is that we should look as you previously referenced as small cap stocks as the canary in the coal mine. And there's another view, which is that oftentimes these big companies lead you out. And of course, the biggest companies always lead out by definition. The way the indices are constructed, that's just always going to be the nature of things. Uh, I think I'm more in your camp. 
right? So that is to say, we are in a bear market. Most stocks are down. This is a point that I was trying to make to somebody who was looking at our performance. And I said, look, we're up 11.5% net of fees, 12.5% gross year on year, actively managed. We've probably done over 400 trades. We have a very active strategy. This is pretty good, right? So we're just just trailing the S&P. They're like, ah, but you're trailing the S&P better off the SPY. And I'd say, but for the most part, we don't own the MAG-7. I had NVIDIA, but I think it's our 29th best performing position. We don't own any of the rest of the MAG-7. I said, just going back to my darts to the board analogy, stocks are down. That's, that's the reality. And I think a lot of people miss that. And I think that that's, that's the tell that people should be looking at. And I think, as I pointed out earlier, that it has its own reflexive economic impact. If businesses start to struggle as well as consumers, it's very, very difficult for things to do well. And actually, it's interesting. They, another reason that they haven't been doing as well, if you took the fiscal deficit out of GDP growth, there wouldn't be it. This is something else that this is, it's an economy that's largely been on life support for some time. And uh, that I think that gets missed. Oh, the GDP numbers are better than we expected. Yeah, we had a $2 trillion deficit. What are you talking about? Two tr- that's just, that is incredible. We're talking about 7 to 8% of GDP. How can, how can you have numbers that big and then GDP growth of less than four? Something's wrong there. That's, I, I don't think uh, anyone has to be too clever to figure that out. I think part of that perception problem is just because we also are in a relatively muted volatility environments, aside from just the VIC, the volatility has been focused obviously on duration, not on most other asset classes. It feels almost like a more of a controlled implosion, you can argue, since last year for most stocks. You are obviously playing with the option side, which I want to touch on. Has the last year and a half, two years been challenging just in terms of trying to get some real interesting, juicy trades because volatility has been maybe disconnected from where you would think it should be? So I'm not 100% sure that it is disconnected from where we think it should be. Here's a, just a couple things to think about. So first of all, the headline number for volatility that most people who look at, at the options markets from the outside are going to look at is something like the VIX, right? That probably that is the number that most people look at when they think about volatility. So let's just think about the VIX's construction for just a moment so that we can understand why we get to where we are. First of all, the VIX is a measure of 30-day volatility on implied volatility on the S&P 500. And so many of the things that hold true for the S&P 500 as a barometer for the health of the markets, as a barometer for the health of the economy and everything else, are going to hold true when you look at the implied volatility on it. So why is that? The first is that, of course, the volatility of any basket of assets um, is going to be functionally related to two key things. One is the size of each of those constituents within the basket. Right. So if you have a constituent that's worth 10% of the basket and you have a whole bunch of constituents that are worth a tenth of a percent, obviously the, the big one's going to matter the most. And that, of course, is true in, in vol as much as it is for the S&P itself. So what that means is that when you're looking at this, it's weighted heavily to the mega cap stocks at the top of the index. So that's the all of the same names that we've been talking about. We're talking about Alphabet, we're talking about Apple and so on. So those businesses, number one, have been doing better and they weigh more in the volatility equation. The second is that, and this goes to my earlier point, that these companies by and large also generate a tremendous amount of free cash flow and on balance generally have a lot of cash on the balance sheet. Now, why is that important? The reason that's important is because the more net cash a company has on its balance sheet, the less volatile, all else equal, the equity is going to be, right? The more leverage there is on the balance sheet, the more volatile it's going to be. Now, somebody would immediately say, hold their hand up and say, well, what are you talking about, Mike? You mean you're... AT&T, Verizon, these companies are very heavily levered and their equity is not that volatile. Well, um, two things about that. Number one, I think there, there's also a little bit of a perception issue and you have utility like businesses. 
So you can certainly find levered balance sheets and companies that don't exhibit a tremendous amount of volatility. But this is just a, a way to normalize things. So when you have the biggest companies that are generally doing better in terms of price action and also have a lot of cash, that's going to, all else equal, is going to lower uh, volatility. There's another interesting thing too, which is, of course, that the second function in how volatile something is, is how related a basket of securities are or assets are to one another. So you can imagine, I'll just create a, a hypothetical index that's only got two stocks in it. Well, if these stocks are perfectly correlated, that index is just going to be the weighted average volatility of those two stocks. When you know they both go up, they both go down, they go up and down together. And so will the index. On the other hand, if they are not highly correlated or if they're anti-correlated, uh, the index is going to actually be quite quiet. So if you have one of the stocks goes up, but the other one goes down by a like amount every time, your index goes nowhere. And so volatility is muted. We refer to that as correlation. And the flip side of correlation is dispersion. The more dispersed the returns of a basket of underlying assets is, that basket is going to be less volatile, all else equal. And you actually alluded to the fact that there is this dispersion going on right now. You have stocks that are going down. A lot of them are going down. Most of them are going. And then you have a smaller number of bigger companies that are going up. So if you're looking at the Russell 3000, which contains all of them, rather than the Russell 2000, which is just going to be the smallest two that's going to exclude the top thousand, that volatility is going to be muted by that effect. So it's, again, this perception and deception thing. There's a lot of cases of significant volatility going on in the market. And look, we owned Dollar General last June or whatever. I think that thing dropped something like 30% in my face in 16, 17 days. We also own Marvell Semiconductor, which was up 50 some odd percent after they reported earnings a while back. But if you took a look at our portfolio fund performance, you're not going to see those types of swings because they're muted by the anti-correlation of these names. So again, I'm not going to tell you that volatility is not there. It is there. Take a look at how some of these stocks are behaving when the numbers aren't great. You get some pretty big drops. So I, I wouldn't be comforted by by low volatility if all you're looking at is the headline figure. I think, Mike, a lot of people know you, obviously, again, on the option side. And I, I'm curious to hear your, your analysis on where sentiment is currently when you look at the options market in particular. Everyone, I think, is taking for granted the seasonality argument. It could be true. Yes, the probabilities do favor a run into December. No disagreements there. But I think people forget that that a probability, which means it's not guaranteed, right? Where are we in terms of sentiment, maybe in terms of entering the end of the year? And is current sentiment extreme to the point where you'd say, well, maybe it's not going to play out the way that the numbers are suggesting? It's not. So let's talk a little bit about what sentiment actually means in, in our context versus how some people might otherwise think about it. So we traffic a lot in volatility. When you traffic a lot in volatility, that means that you have to have uh, high fidelity volatility surfaces, which means that you have to have essentially a decent understanding and ar arbitrage free understanding of how options are priced from near dated to far, from high strikes to low, and so on. That's what we're really, for anybody who's unfamiliar with, with volatility, that's just a simple way to think about it. And when we look at sentiment, there, there are some very back in the napkin techniques that a lot of people will sometimes cite. They will look at things like put call ratios. They will look at skew, which is the price of calls, out of the money calls relative to out of the money puts. Some people will suggest that when puts are highly elevated relative to the price of calls, that that put skew is a, is a measure of sentiment. The way we look at it is we actually calculate for every expiration. And we tend to focus on underlying instruments that, that have very short dated options. So and it's going to be the indices, which actually go down to zero DTE options now. And for the ETFs, the big ones, you might have every other day and for a lot of the big stocks, weeklies. And what we do is, that, is we have basically the average expected return for, for stocks for each and every expiration, which is, if you think about it, a weighted probability of all of the options. And then we also test for risk. And what we think of as risk is, um, some people call it excess shortfall. Um, other people call it conditional VAR. And what we're referring to here is you take, you take a look at the distribution and you say, okay, well, let's take the 90% probabilities. And then I'm going to look at the, the down five, the lowest 
percentile and the highest. And I take the mean value for those tail events. So what's the mean value of the downside tail of, um, as a measure of risk? Um, and that number, in a lot of instances, is, is higher, right? What's interesting, though, is that when you take the average expected return over that risk profile, it's not, it's not terrible. I'm going to say it's in the, in the middle there. So I, I think that kind of reflects the fact there are people that are starting to clue themselves into, and what really causes those downside events, by the way, it's, it's worth noting just in an index or anything else, are credit events, corporate credit events and things like that. That's, that's when you really start to get significant volatility and the options need to price that in somehow. And so there is an increased likelihood of the of that priced into the market right now. And then there also seems to be some seasonal bullishness. And I think that accounts for the fact that when you take a look at the average expected return over risk, that it's actually meh. I hate <laughs> the best word I have for it to describe it right now. There's this perception that we're in a good time of year but there's also a perception that this downside risk exists. Our strategy did pretty well uh, this time last year is doing less so this year. And because we focus on event trading, what that tells me is that okay news is treated, is being treated more poorly. Good news is not being treated as well. And bad news is being treated very badly. Because again, think about how we, we look at the world. We're often trading into names going into earnings. And these are stocks that typically are going to move more than they would on average. So I think our own performance actually is, is going to indicate in our long only strategy. I think it's actually a pretty good indication where sentiment is. If people don't treat good news and as enthusiastically as they normally do, and they treat bad news much worse, that's, that's a tell to me. And it's not a good one. From an event at uh, trading perspective, has it been easier to trade certain industry group this year versus others? Where has the, the action been outside of the tech side? So we, if you are an event, if you are an event driven trading and you focus and traffic heavily in earnings, you actually are going to end up playing everything at one point or another. We own Deer right now, for example. Um, that's obviously a very uh, different thing than NVIDIA. Um, so the, the interesting thing, and I'm actually just looking at this because our fiscal year doesn't align with the calendar, uh, year. I had a semi-annual letter to put out, um, for the period, uh, that was ending, uh, a month ago or so. And, uh, I actually saw that our worst performing group this year, interestingly enough, was Staples. That caught me a little bit by surprise in one sense, but then not in another. The reason I was surprised by that is because I figured that would be a decent place to hide out. Turns out, going into events, that wasn't true. But there's another reason that, is that some of these things uh, just don't, they just don't trade well in general. And that could actually, in part, be a function of the fact that that's a group that also carries a bit more debt, right? I know you focus more on the credit side and, and I more on the, on the equity side. But of course, these these things are very closely related. They're functionally related to one another. And uh, this sort of goes to my, my early theme, which is that if a company carries a lot of debt, it's a tough environment for that. You're just, if you have debt that's going to be rolling over, you're going to be paying a higher rate, and that just is going to hurt the economics of your business. There's no way to get around that. Your interest expense is going to rise. And so that has a lot to do with, with the turn. It's interesting. I was looking at a this guy's financial technology platform about a week or two ago. And he had this sort of a radar that can track analysts' price targets for stocks through time. It almost looks like if you if you can imagine a car riding on top of a price chart, the beam of the headlights basically is the range of future price targets. And one of the things I found so interesting about it was that as I was watching that range, it bore such close similarity to Fed policy on rates. And that is that they're always lagging. They're always lagging the price action. I was never really that much into technical analysis when I got started in the business because I worked for a deep dive fundamental shop. And in the vol space, we were typically trying to run pretty close to delta neutral. So it wasn't really my business to try to traffic in short-term moves in stock prices 
um, like it is these days. Um, but it is amazing how much truth is embedded in price. Um, that's just a, another observation that, you know, look, I'm a slow learner. It took me a long time to figure that one out. Um, luckily, the nature of the trading that I was doing in the early days didn't require it. So uh, I wasn't you know, punished for my ignorance. But it's something that people should really pay close attention to. There's a, there's a lot of truth in price. So, so watch out there. I got a little sidetracked on that. I don't know. If no, I no, no, no. Well, that's actually a good direction because I, th- I, I think that that's an interesting uh, thread to pull on. The uh, I've asked plenty of other people in these spaces the question of whether they think uh, markets have, oddly enough, maybe become more inefficient, uh, largely because of the popularity of zero DCE options and because you have what I myself coined you know, that term uneducated speculators, right? Post COVID, where yeah, you know, people are playing with options, leveraging things up, not even realizing how much risk they're taking or why they're doing what they're doing. Is there any truth to that? So, yeah, there might be truth in price, but there might be also a lot more relative emotion. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting one. And this is a real area of interest for me because when we're looking at these well surfaces, they are being impacted in ways large and small by all of the market participants. And there is absolutely no question that there were a lot of uninformed investors who rushed in with pandemic paychecks at the ready to deploy into derivative markets, oftentimes somewhat foolishly. I I am a believer in the wisdom of crowds. And the the reality is that crowds are going to have people who don't have the first damn clue. What's interesting, of course, when you deal with financial markets, is that not every vote counts the same. What I mean by that is, when And probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with the book, The Wisdom of Crowds, but it's a concept that goes back to the 1800s where, sorry for boring people who know the story, but for those that don't, um, they were going to slaughter an ox. And the fair goers were all permitted to come up and speculate on, the, on basically the slaughtered weight of this thing. And uh, there were... Because fairs oftentimes were places where farmers would show their wares and the producers of meat products would actually go to buy these things. So you had a lot of informed people in the audience. You had a lot of uninformed people too, who just went for the fair. People who went for the games and the prizes or to see farmers take their oxes and see whose could pull the most and all the rest. And what they found was that the, that the collective wisdom of the crowd actually produced a remarkably accurate uh, result. So that was the beginning of this wisdom of crowds idea. Now, a lot of work's been done on this since that time because a lot of people were fascinated by the results. How could a group of people, many of whom had no clue and many of whom made absurd guesses? You're talking about an animal that slaughtered ended up weighing half a ton and there were going to be people in the crowd. Maybe a five-year-old said they thought it weighed 10 pounds. So Nowhere close. So how could a group of people that had guesses so incorrect actually prove to be more accurate than most of the experts were? Now, more research on this, and I think a bunch of people at MIT are doing a lot of it, has revealed that this works in, in a blind sense, but not in a sense where the crowd is really communicating with each other. So in this crowd, for example, You've been talking a lot. I've been talking a lot. Maybe there's some people who didn't have a strong opinion, and they're going to leave saying, I think Mike is right. So therefore, I have a more bearish take on this. And maybe that skews the whole population. Or maybe I just sound like an idiot, and everybody goes the other way. Both would be equally valid, I might argue. But in the financial markets, the big difference is that when you place your bet what's going to happen, you are committing your capital. Now, maybe that capital was given to you by the government during the pandemic, or maybe it's hard-fought money that you've earned over a lifetime, or maybe you're an expert. But the interesting thing is that the people whose bets weigh the most are the ones who commit the most. So the big institutional players are committing more capital. Now, you can get overrun, as some folks learned in some of the meme stocks, but in the general case, that's, that's not what's going on. So. I think that if we're looking at price for truth, in most cases, it's probably a decent representation because there's asymmetry in information. We know this. The 
the story I like to to tell people is you can imagine if you're playing Texas Hold'em. We there's a lot of information. Most of the information that's out there, we all know because companies publish this information. They have to quarterly, right? So that's those are the five cards that are laid right on the table. And then maybe you do a little extra work, and so you've got two cards that no one else can see. Same is true for everybody else. But you should pay close attention to how other people bet and how much they bet. And that's essentially what price is giving you, is that people who can really bet a lot and are betting a lot, maybe they know something you don't, and you shouldn't ignore it. Yeah, and I think it's, that's very, very well articulated. As we wrap up here, folks, everybody, please, first of all, make sure you follow Michael here on X. You've been in business for a while, Mike. You've seen a lot of interesting cycles and changes. Is this among the more unusual last two, three years? I guess you can say that that's probably true across the board, given what happened post-COVID, but... It seems that a lot of traders or investors are using frameworks for how to think about the economy and how to think about market structure in an environment where things are not co-moving and acting the way that historically they have. At some point, hopefully everything will resync. But how do you think about just the last two, three years in terms of your own knowledge and skill set and whether anything's really been working the way you expect it or not? Yeah, I, I don't know that I've ever been as freaked out as, as I am right now. I remember the collapse of the Asian Tigers. I remember the tech wreck distinctly. And I can remember really freaking out about valuations at that time. I was a kid, basically, and just starting out in the business. And I, I can remember driving from New York City up to New Hampshire, where my parents lived. My dad was an orthodontist. And he was buying Cisco and all this other kind of stuff. And I was insane multiples. And I remember going up there and screaming in their, in their kitchen and telling my father that if his orthodontic practice was valued the way Cisco was, and he lived in a town with a, less than 7,000 people in it, he said, your, your orthodontic practice would be worth about $180 million based on the valuation of Cisco at his peak where he was buying it. So I was in quite a frenzy at the time. This, this one freaks me out a little bit more than that, though. GFC, I have to say, that was quite remarkable. And I did wonder whether we were going to stall spin in at that point. But once Paulson and everybody else started throwing tons of money at it, it was interesting because uh, this was the this was maybe the one and only time that I was supportive of some of the, what people charitably call heterodox monetary policy, which I absolutely abhor. but. It was maybe the one case where I thought it was, it was actually warranted because when you have massive debt bubble implosion, it destroys the money supply. And the first efforts at this monetary policy didn't create new money. It basically brought back what had been destroyed. Now, whether that was a moral hazard, I think we can agree that it was. But that might have been the only time that I, I think it really stabilized things. And so that was a short-lived concern. A lot of people saw this as an opportunity. You know, it was more of a market's meltdown as a function of that monetary creation um, rather than what it could have been, which is, you know, a depression. I saw the flash crash. That was pretty, pretty, pretty remarkable. The 2018 washout, what concerned me about that was that it just illustrated how dependent uh, we are on basically the IV that's in our arm with policy. Uh, this situation, what concerns me is that you know the debt levels are so much bigger. And government debt in particular, this is a really tough one uh, to get out of in a rising rate environment uh, because it's just, it's, it's a problem that feeds on itself as the interest rates rise and as the interest expense rises, we end up, we're borrowing money to pay interest that that is that's just turn out well so that's what really freaks me out is that the solutions that we had in the past don't exist for this one the gfc was a big problem but we had tools that could fix it the tech wreck was it, a big problem but more isolated than this one is and and that's why i'm freaked out here but in fairness if we if we don't make too many more mistakes, that's a tough one, by the way, because uh, with the folks in Washington and other policymakers, but we do have an economy that has the capability to to solve this, but it's getting a lot harder. That window is uh, is narrowing. That's it's tough. It's a tough environment. 
Yeah, and it's a it's a global phenomenon, as we know. It's just a, the the limits of uh, maybe democracy and capitalism coexisting, and when you get elected for promising more, which just means keep on adding to that that tab. Mm-hmm. That's right, um, yeah. Mike. Mike, for those who want to track uh, more of your thoughts and your work, where would you point them to? Uh, yeah, I mean, go ahead, follow me on on Twitter. I I you know I write some articles for CNBC a uh, couple of week. Probably, and I don't know. I kind of like what you're doing. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll do something like that if I can find the time, or maybe you'll hear me uh, me, me and you talk more often if I get the invitation. But yeah, just follow me on Twitter, and I'll probably post links to to work that I have that's in the public sphere. Again, everybody, please make sure you follow Michael Co here on X. I have another space coming up in literally six minutes. You'll hear this as another podcast in a couple of days. And Mike, uh, enjoy Thanksgiving. Uh, appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Cheers, everybody.